Yeah, go. Thank, thanks, Kathleen. <laughs> Morning, everyone. I'm, uh, I'm Simon, and I, I normally start these talks by apologising because I'm going to disagree with every speaker that's gone before me because uh, usually they're high on Amazon and worshipping at the altar of cloud. Um, it's nice following your end when you've actually got somebody that's operating real equipment and controlling actual, actual servers still, which is the world and, and the perspective that, that, that we come from. Not that there's anything wrong with cloud. Um, there's many good technologies that we can, all, we can all benefit from. We just don't worship it in the way that others might. Um, a, little, a little intro to me. Um, I founded SimWord back 20-something uh, years ago. Uh, back then, we were the world's uh, first global gateway between the internet and mobile phones, both of which looked like they might catch on. We used SMS as, as the transport, so we were pretty much one of the, one of the first aggregators sending SMS between, between networks um, at a time when you couldn't actually easily do so. Um, got distracted with the dot-com boom and refocused on this business in about 2005. So what you see as SimWood today was, was really born in, in 2005. And, and that is a, a voice carrier with a foot in two worlds, really. We have a foot in the old world of telecoms to give us regulated access and regulated economies to the, to the things that we need. And a foot in the new world selling services to a new breed of of startups, ITSPs, and, and new age carriers. And we try and be different. Our passion is very much in the new world. The necessity is in the old world. But we make old technology and old access available to people in a new way through, through APIs. We're well known for research and being quite outspoken on a few issues. Um, VoIP fraud and control of VoIP fraud is one of our, um, one of our specialities through the API. And it's something we've put, put out lots of, lots of research over the years, including, you know, most recently, a little book there. Um, we're UK originated, so we've got quite an evolved physical network in the UK. Uh, we own a fibre ring around Manchester. We co-own a, a fibre ring around, um, around London. But our UK network is, is fundamentally three availability zones. The idea of availability zone meaning that one can go away or even two can go away and we can still provide core service to, to customers. Um, as of 2017, uh, we became a licensed carrier in the US, and we have East and West Coast Pops and a little pop in, in Asia. Um, that's customer-led. We've got, we're very fortunate, we've got a number of quite large global customers that like what we do for them in the UK and have demanded that we can do that in their, their home and, and overseas markets. So the US is, is growing. We're, we're clambering up the food chain in the US, a bit like we did in the UK all those years ago. But it's, but it's happening far quicker over there than it did, it did over here. So today, I'm going to tell you a little story and then talk about this thing, this thing called the autopilot pattern and then conclude with, with an example. And it, it follows on, I think, to some extent, from, from what Joran was, uh, was, was talking about. So I hope we'll, we'll resonate with you. Um, before I do, who in the room is running containers in production? Okay, three of you, four, five of you, six, seven. Okay, who has tried to run containers and found it all a bit hard and complicated? Okay, a few of you. Who knows how to install Kubernetes? Okay, three of you. All right. <laughs> so, a story. In uh, 1903, um, Orville and Wilbur Wright took flight. And it was the first manned powered flight in history. They'd been trying since 1899, but nobody had ever heard of them. Um, operating in a, in a field, taking home their broken bits every night and trying to, trying to repair things. Everybody had, by contrast, heard of a guy called Samuel Pierpoint Langley, who was very well funded, funded by the War Commission, followed around the place by the, uh, by the press corps. Very, very high profile, enjoying uh, the status that, uh, that it gave him. But they had a very different approach. Samuel Pierpoint Langley was trying to fly with, with brute force. He thought it was all about the engine. The engine was powerful enough it could hold this plane up in the air. The Wright brothers realized that it was a little bit more subtle than that, that this, this aircraft had changing characteristics. And somebody had to adapt the aircraft to those, to those changing characteristics. You had to fly it. But 
man became or man remained obsessed with this idea of unmanned orchestrated, uh, orchestrated flight. And this little beastie um, was born in 1917. It's called the Kettering Bug. And it might look like an aeroplane, but it's actually the world's first cruise missile. Um, an engineer would calibrate the engine, the engine revolutions uh, and line the, line the aircraft up according to the target. It would fly 75 miles, detonate on its target, and obviously, obviously not return. But if you think of UAVs as we know them today, there was so much parallel development that needed to take place to get anything close to what we've, what we've got today. And there's just, you know, just some of the examples there on that screen. And that happened in the 1950s to, to a large extent. But by 1994, we got to what we think, today as, as, uh, think of today as a UAV, namely Predator drone. But even in 1994, when this was used in, in Kosovo, it was only used in a recon um, capacity. It, it wasn't at the, the level that it is today. It was actually 2000 when it was used in Afghanistan that it could be flown from the other side of the world rather than needing guys in a van at the end of the runway and could be, and could be armed. It took 91 years to get to that stage from when Orville and Wilbur first, first took flight. And I wonder what would have happened if they'd bogged themselves down with decisions at an early stage that didn't affect that, that fundamental, simple, simple mission. I think there'd have been two outcomes. One, They'd have been paralyzed, trying to make decisions that they frankly, technology wasn't at a stage they could, they could, they could make. They would have been distracted from their primary, primary aim. And secondly, they could have made those decisions, but been locked in to technology that continued to evolve. And in the worst case, had to go back and re-engineer something that they'd built on top of that, that technology because of a wrong choice early on. Instead, thankfully, they just flew the freaking thing, and they left all that complication for another day. And so that brings us to containerization, which is awesome. At Simwood, we're almost entirely containerized uh, now, and it's been an interesting journey. But when you start on that journey, your end goal isn't just about having containers instead of virtual machines or, or bare metal machines. It, has this tendency to encompass so much more. And it becomes this, this huge mission that changes your entire development practices, changes your entire monitoring practices, changes your, de changes your deployment. It becomes something far bigger than it should be. And there's a hell of a lot of decisions. You think you can download Docker on your laptop, configure a container, deploy it. You can't. There's a lot, lot more to it when you actually, actually get into it. And one of the, uh, one of the early ones um, for us was around the network. Now, this was quite an easy one and one that we wanted to wrestle with because we had fundamental issues with the way Docker worked from a networking perspective, especially coming at things from a, from a SIP perspective. But even if you don't, there's still a, there's still a choice. Are you going to use host network? Are you going to use Docker Bridge? What about overlays so hosts can, can talk to each other? Now, for us, we got quite involved in this um, because we didn't like that bad boy, um, the Docker bridge. For those of you not familiar, you have an external address that's, that's usually the host address and all your containers have internal RFC 1918 addresses. They can talk to each other on the host, but everything going out from the host is, is natted. And if you want to talk between hosts, then you have to get into the complexity of an overlay so that everything can be translated and that can be work. It can work. We just wanted what we'd had before, which was that a container was a first-class citizen on the network. The same as a virtual machine had been, the same as a, physical, as a physical machine had been before it. We wanted to avoid that, and we wanted to, as best as possible, try and avoid a whole lot of user land um, you know, translation that was, that was going on. We had two iterations of it. This is the second. The first, we rewrote the Docker, Docker plugin um, and had a thing we called Simwood Container Networking, which, which worked quite well, but wasn't really maintainable um, as we were, we were upgrading other things. So we went back to basics, got a, got a little bit simpler. We installed a BGP daemon on the host, and for those that you aren't familiar, BGP is the protocol by which IP addresses are announced between, between routers. So the host effectively became a router and could talk to the network and say, hey, these are the IP addresses I've 
I've got in service on me. And similarly, the containers were given a small BGP speaker as well. So they could say to the host, hey, I'm here, this is my IP address. So all of a sudden, we got the capability to wrap up all of our network config in a container. We could deploy any container on any host anywhere on the network, and it would come into life and it would say, I'm here, this is my IP address, and by the magic of networking, traffic, traffic would find it. But it got better than that, because there's a protocol that you might not have heard of called FlowSpec. FlowSpec is a protocol by which essentially firewall rules, or at least access control lists, can be carried in BGP and installed on devices along the way. So now our containers, as well as having a defined uh, networking profile, could also have a defined security profile. So we spin up our little web container, say, in San Jose. It says to the network, hey, I'm here. This is my IP address. Give me traffic. And by the way, I only want traffic on port 443 from these, these hosts. And that will be installed at the host level in IP tables and above it, above it in the network to the depth that we, we choose to. It's beautiful. Works, works great. And we've got exactly what we want, that a container is a first-class citizen on the network. But because a, sorry, I'll come on to that. If you look at a, if you look at a trace of um, any of our services, because of that, you will see, a, you'll see a, essentially an extra, an extra hop. So the container, the first class citizen, is obviously a last hop, but your host is appearing in your trace there just as, a, just as another router. It's acting as a router in the, in the path. And because of all of this, because the container is a first class citizen on the network, and because it's announcing its IP address to, to the network, we can do other things like Anycast. Now, we've gone to town with Anycast, and it's, it's a big topic that I spoke about quite a bit last year, so there's, there's videos on it. I won't go into too much, too much depth. But fundamentally, it's the same IP address existing in multiple places on, on the network. And because it exists in multiple places on the network, traffic finds its way to the closest, closest instance. You'll be most familiar of it if you use Google's 88888 DNS. You always hit the local node where, wherever you are. Anycast is big and global and sexy, and marketing people love to say, hey, we're Anycasted. But the biggest benefit we've got from Anycast has been right at the center of our application. So I don't think there's a service within the SIMWood application stack that doesn't have Anycast at some, some part of it. So take an example here of uh, Akama Elio talking to a Redis. Redis, every single Redis, and we've got rather a lot of them around the network, has the same IP address. So you want to read Redis, it's always the same IP address. So Kama Elio here, wanting to query Redis, it's the same IP address, whichever, whichever node is, is, is doing it. And because of the way any cast and routing works, they will hit the closest node to them. Thus, a Kama Elio on a host talking to a Redis container on the same host, the traffic will never need to leave the host. It will always, it will always stay local. Until that node fails, of course, when Kama Elio will see the Redis disconnected, will try to reconnect, and we'll hit the next closest instance of, of Redis, which will likely be on, on the host next door. Slight digress, digression there into, into networking, but then the next decision you're going to make is storage. Coming from a world of VMs where you've got to have shared storage to be able to, to move VMs between hosts must be necessary. Now, I'm the guy that got through seven SANS in six years. Um, through natural disaster and bugs never previously discovered. And you come up with any, any bad news, and I've lived it with shared storage. I've melted the things. It, it was horrible. So I need no persuasion not to have shared, shared storage. And thankfully, the world has, has moved on. Um, we no longer need shared storage for any kind of shared state. And in a containerized world where we're dealing with ephemeral images, we don't really need shared storage to to manage the migration of those between, between machines. So we just didn't bother. Um, where there's data to be shared between containers, we're using clustered services. So you know, Galera, for example, for MySQL, Elasticsearch, all of those. Um, share data between nodes without needing any kind of shared storage. Now, obviously, they're all writing to SSDs on the local host. And those SSDs are persisting state between reboots and the like. But were a host to be totally destroyed, that data lives in other places by virtue of those services being, um, being clustered. So that was a problem we didn't need to solve, thankfully. 
The next problem is what you're going to do about service discovery. And there'll be all these other fancy products that can, can solve your problems and, and make, your life, make your life easy. Is it console? Is it ETCZ? Is it Zookeeper? I don't know. Um, we started with console. Um, I wouldn't say that was a terribly you know, informed choice, but that, that, that was the way we went. And as a distributed key, key value store, um, it, worked, it worked OK for us. Um, but we evolved beyond that. Um, we basically broke console when we um, rewrote the, the Docker networking stack. So we were forced to kind of roll our own that we affectionately call Gaylord. Um, Gaylord is shared, uh, a shared key value store, essentially, bet between nodes. But it also does uh, health checking of containers and, and the like. And it's very relevant for what we were doing with, with the autopilot pattern. But it's important to make the point that to do the autopilot, to make, to apply the auto pattern, pat, blah, 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 autopilot pattern, you don't need to rewrite your own service discovery. You can do it with, with any of them. And finally, this big question, oh, what are you going to do about orchestration? You must use Kubernetes because, you know, then you can scale to Google size next week. Well, this seemed really complicated, to be honest. And, and every time we looked at it, it just seemed a bigger project than the containerization itself. So we were faced with the choice that do we make things really complicated and make decisions that we don't really understand? Or is there a simpler way of, of, of moving forward? And we just wanted to kick this into the long grass. We didn't want to say you don't need it. We just wanted to defer some of those decisions and try and keep life simple and controlled and learn in incremental steps rather than going from here to a thousand miles away in, in, in one step. There's those that would solve that problem by saying, do what the cloud says. Um, the problem with that approach is you're locked into somebody else's decision. So you use you know, Google Compute, you're locked into Kubernetes, you use Amazon, you're locked into something, something else. So we didn't agree with, with that philosophy. But more fundamentally, when containerization was sold to me originally, it was this idea that a developer can create something on his laptop, run it on his laptop exactly the same way as it would do in production, um, and deploy it. And it would run exactly the same. Well, the further you go down the road of having big things, orchestrating things from a central point, the further away from that you, you are, because you've got to recreate that environment on the, on the laptop to, um, to get there. And we didn't want that. So we tried to save it as a problem for another day, but we had practical challenges, you know, as, as Joran um, presented previously, around managing this stuff, around deploying stuff, around getting to a point of continuous development, continuous integration without this, this stuff. And that led us to the autopilot pattern. Now, I believe a container should fly itself. You should start the thing, and it should just go. It should discover what its role is in the network. And crucially, once it's up and running, it should adapt to changes in the network and in applications. What you shouldn't have is some jock SSHing into it and making changes that aren't committed to, it's to version control. You know, everything originates in version control. That's one of the key benefits with, with containerization. Similarly, you shouldn't need the one person in the company that knows how this stuff works to be able to, to deploy it. And you shouldn't rely on any ex external orchestration platform. I'm not saying you can't use one, but you shouldn't rely on one, be dependent on one. And that's what the autopilot pattern gave us. Um, it's a philosophy. It's not my philosophy. It's put out by the, or was originally put out by the very bright guys at Joyent, who are a cloud operator, but also the guys behind um, Node.js. And you can read more about it there. Um, but it is a philosophy. It's not a list of 10 do's and don'ts. You can apply this however suits you. And you'll probably apply it in a very different way to, um, to we have that, that suits your business and suits your, um, your culture, ultimately. I wrote a blog about our approach um, previously that you, you're welcome to, to, to go and have a read of. Um, but I promised you an example and well, a few examples of how we, actually, how we actually use this. So we deploy a container to a host, or actually to multiple hosts. Now, at this stage, you could do it manually. You could use a deployment script. You could use Ansible, as uh, Joen talked, talked about previously. This gets quite easy for us, because we only really have two types of hosts. We have compute nodes that have general 
general containers on, and we have voice compute nodes that have anything that handles RTP. That abstraction gives us a very clean and easy delineation that makes it easy to enforce quality of service on the network, et cetera, et cetera. But we also have a policy that everything is everywhere. So every compute node has all the appropriate containers on it. Every voice compute node has all the appropriate containers on it. So we don't have a scenario of managing, well, am I going to put this over there? And if I do that, am I going to put that over there? There's none, there's none of that. If there's a new container, it's everywhere. Um, and that's quite easy to, 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 to handle. On deployment, there's certain things that change. Um, there's certain environment variables that need to replace certain things in, in, in the config files, such as what availability zone am I in, because that can affect certain things down the line. Um, yeah, availability zone prefix for certain things as being an example. Um, and the role of the container needs to be determined. So to start, start with an example, Redis. We use Redis massively. We've got dozens and dozens and dozens of them. Uh, sort of everything front of house, line of business, um, is 100% Redis. But it's largely ephemeral. Uh, we still use Galera as like the ultimate um, persistent data store. But we, we carry something like 20 gig in, in Redis in, in ephemeral um, data, and we have an awful lot of them. Now, we could have a master Redis image, and we could have a slave Redis image, and we could choose which one that we deploy where we don't. We just have a Redis image. And when it starts, through the autopilot pattern, it determines what its role is. Now, that essentially entails querying a key value store and saying, who's the master? If it finds a master in the key value store, it knows it must be a slave. If it doesn't find a master in the key value store and a few other checks pass, such as the availability of that key value store, it knows it should be the master. And this is happening itself as it's, as it's starting. Um, if you use Redis, you'll know that uh, when the slaves sync to, to the master, they download a full, a full data set. And if you've got lots of slaves all connecting to your master at, at once, that can be lots of data sets wanging about. Um, you'll also know that when it loads that data set from disk into RAM, it actually blocks. So you don't want that slave receiving queries at that time. What we do is our master is configured to dump its data and back that up to, to an off-site um, object store every minute or so. The slaves, when they've determined they are slaves, are configured to go and retrieve the latest copy of that, avoiding any, any load um, on the master. So we've got, this, we've got this container, it's started, it's determined, say, it needs to be a slave, it's gone to an object store and it's got the most recent backup of the data, all on its own. The next stage is to connect to, the next stage is to connect to the master. And if you use Redis, you know, it, it does a, the recent versions at least do a kind of partial, partial sync. So it's a, I've got this 20 gig from five minutes ago, what's changed? catches up, eventually starts, starts replicating, becomes a, becomes a useful slave. At that point, and at that point only, it's ready for service. Now contrast this with another approach where you just started a container. It's in service, it's going to start receiving queries, but it hasn't got any, any data. In our scenario, that container is instantiated, restores itself, checks it's all OK, takes a deep breath, and then says to both Gaylord and the network, hey, I'm here, send me some traffic. Um, and because it's any casted, as soon as it announces its IP address to the network, it will start receiving, it will start receiving new connections. From that point on, um, we have a number of health checks. And these were essentially querying state within the container, but grouping that state as, a, as an endpoint. So to move on from Redis, uh, another example is free switch and camera Elio. So all of our free switch nodes are grouped within a, within a particular site, and there's a health check linked to the, the Kama Elio container that says, hey, what free switches have I got available? And that gets a return something like that. It's simply, simply JSON showing you know, name, container name, IP address. It monitors that. It polls that. And if it sees a change, it knows that there's been a a state change in the network. And it's important to point out this is just HTTPS. So whereas with certain big orchestration platforms, you might be tied to the notion of pods, um, with this, it's perfectly feasible for the Kama Elio in London to be monitoring the state of the free switches in San Jose, because that may well affect um, how, they're, how they're configured. 
In the event of any change, um, we simply execute a script. Um, call it non-change script. It can be anything you want. It can be a shell script, it can be a, can, can be a binary, it can be, can be whatever. And it, it can pass through certain environment variables as you'd expect. <laughs> So in our scenario with Kama, Elio, and FreeSwitch, if there's a change in the available free switches at the, the monitored endpoint, we simply rewrite the dispatcher conf text file and issue cam control reload. So we can spin up a free switch container anywhere. It gets itself ready to go. It announces itself as ready for service. And then the Kama, Elio automatically adapts to it, to it being there. Similarly, they can go away. They can disappear. And they'll be handled gracefully. Um, within the Kamaelio config. So we talked about Redis, being able to deploy a node, it discovering its role, um, it getting ready for service, announcing itself as, as any cast. We talked about Kamaelio and FreeSwitch. The, the more common example um, is, of course, you know, web services, APIs, um, all of that. We have a lot of that. Um, all of our call routing for FreeSwitch, for example, is uh, you know, Node.js presented as a, as a web service. All of that is, is anycasted. Anything external facing, such as, um, such as APIs, portals, um, the website, that is all anycasted behind an anycasted um, Nginx uh, web application firewall and, um, and router, uh, effectively. But they're all using this, this autopilot uh, technique um, to bring themselves into service, to manage state, and to handle handle failure scenarios. So you want to do this yourself. The easiest way to get started, and the way we got what got started, was to, to have a look at what the the joint guys originally put out. So they they put out a little library called Container Pilot um, that works with with console, and you can use that and wrap essentially wrap your executable within it. So what that exposes to you is all of this on-change goodness. And it works, it works with console in the sense that you can write uh, expiring keys to console. For example, take a, take a database that wants to be the, the master. It writes to console that, hey, I'm the master, and this is, this is, my, this is my location. Anything else querying console, say who's the master, will get, get that as an answer. But if that container goes away, that key expires, another container can say, hey, there's no master, I better, better assume that role. That may do it for you, or you may find that your culture, your philosophy takes you in a slightly different direction, but that is a, that is a brilliant place to, to start with it, and it's certainly where we, where we started. Looking to the future, um, I think there's always this tussle with uh, Containers. Some people want them to be absolutely tiny, and that, you know, philosophically, that's where, where they came from. They should be as small as possible. Other people like me want to shoehorn more into them, but don't want to, you don't want to make them too big. I think there's a balance there. On balance, I think we've probably got too much outside of the container and need to put more into it. I, I have this vision of every container pre presenting an API to, to every other container. So every container can interrelate and discover state uh, around the network almost without any external um, service like, like, like say, Gaylord. Um, but there is, there is a balance there because you don't want to go back to the world of you know, containers being pseudo VMs with big bloaty full operating systems. But, but some, of the, um, you know, some of the functionality we're talking here is just a couple of extra scripts. Um, it's, it's, it's not significant. I want to expose more telemetry, because the other thing that Autopilot um, you know, gives us is the ability to monitor a container as an endpoint and see within that container what's going on and see that in a consistent, consistent form. For example, you know, number of calls up on a given free switch node can be presented as an API from the container, rather than necessarily needing to interrogate um, you know, free switch at a, at, a, at a lower level. But ultimately, we need to decide on um, orchestration platform, because to go back to where I started, orchestration isn't bad. It's just flipping complicated, and it was a, it was a complication we just wanted to kick into the long grass um, and save for another day. But with that, has anybody got any questions? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh. Hi, thank you. It's Marcus from Sipgate. And you're talking about Anycast. Um, yeah. Do you use UDP and TCP? And if you use TCP, do you have some 
layer four load balancers in front, like IPVS, or so doing some network stuff like ICMP? Yeah, so it depends on what level you use Anycast. So, so you, your global Anycast, you've got to be more careful of routing changes. The closer you come centrally, the more control you've got over it. There's a, there's a tech uh, technique, technology, um, within routers and also within our hosts called ECMP. Um, ECMP stands for Equal Cost Multipath. So what that essentially says is you will hash, you'll hash the flow, and any flows matching that same hash will go the same way. So if you've got 10 hosts behind a switch all running the same, the same container with the same IP address, the switch will look in our case, source and destination IP, source and destination port, and make sure they always go the same, the same way. Of course, if one goes away, then it's gonna, it, it, it's gonna send it to another one, but that would be a new connection anyway. Um, on the edge, we employ ECMP as well, but we obviously haven't got control of those, those links. It could come into to another site altogether due to a, a third party routing change. So you've gotta be far more careful and try and be far more stateless in that scenario. So, uh, hi, yeah, thanks. Um, so, uh, that sounded quite good, putting the, the decisions more locally into the containers. What about some things you can only decide globally, e example scaling, or how do you prevent the, the containers from committing suicide because of newer versions where before there are actually new containers? <laughs> and um, do you all decide that locally, or is there at least some configuration about how many containers you want to have? Yeah, now scaling is an interesting question, because uh, people think of scaling, it's, it's the common answer why you need, why you need Kubernetes. So you can have one, connect, you know, one container today and 10 million tomorrow, because that's what the marketing department are going to deliver. Um, for us, practically that level of scaling isn't really um, appropriate. For us, scaling is a, is a time of day thing and a, and a, and a month to month thing, not a, an hour to hour thing in response to the latest AdWords, um, AdWords campaign. But we deploy the same containers everywhere within hosts that are amply capable of doing substantially more work than they do, so grossly over provisioned, you, you might say. We've also got scope to deploy this to, to the cloud, subject to cloud platform. And there's a couple that we work with where they give us essentially bare metal that we can put all our own stuff on, um, but with orchestration of, of that bare metal. And that, that, works, that works quite well for us. As to the committing suicide thing, um, it's not a problem that we've had. Um, you know, when we, everything is designed to be backwardly compatible or a completely new service for, for fairly obvious, obvious reasons. Um, and any, any deployment is just a rolling, a rolling upgrade around the network. That's another great way um, Anycast helps. Let's say we want to upgrade a version of Redis, we can frankly just, just kill the container and another one will take, will take the, the load. You're not going to be black holing traffic to, to, to that host in the way that you would do if you're using other kinds of service discovery that, that needed to keep up. Is that actually a question? Yeah, mostly. Uh, may I just. <laughs> um, but you will have to uh, tune the numbers a little, I think. There may be services from which you only need several containers and others you need a lot. And so you have one central configuration? Um, yes, yes and no. Um, with, with Anycast, you're restricted to, even the way we do it, you're essentially restricted to one instance of that container per, per physical host because you can't have the same IP address existing multiple times on the same, um, on the same device. So for us, it's really a question of how many new hosts do we need, not how many instances of a container that we need. But that given container can do a lot more work relatively in the host to to others. So we do manage that, but we don't tune that in the way that you're, we don't have a big knob as to how many instances of that container do I need. We probably have far more than we need because of this policy of every host has every container, but a container is so lightweight, if it's sitting there doing their work, it's sitting there doing their work, it's, it's not significant overhead like there would have been in, say, the days of a VM where you wouldn't have contemplated putting every VM on every, every VM host. You just couldn't handle it. Yeah, thanks. Daniel. Also make, make, make it an easy one. Yeah, no, it's about the RTP relaying. Do you also do it with containers and virtualization, or you still have like better well, method? That's an interesting question. I don't know if you've got some inside knowledge there. So, yeah, so yes and no. So, we're going through a state of uh, 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 
change here. So where we had FreeSwitch as the media engine essentially, or acting, acting as B2B UA, that was fully containerized, but containerized on a host devoted to handling RTP. And that's just force of habit over, over many years. We always, we've always kept compute and voice compute separately. Practically and in testing, they could coexist quite happily. We, we just choose not to. We're moving towards RTP engine um, increasingly. Um, it's awesome. And we're moving towards RTP engine orchestrated more by Camera Elio, so diminishing the role of a free switch in the stack. Um, as you know, RTP engine will work very efficiently using kernel module, but will fall back to um, user land if it needs to transcode. So we tried that in, in containers, and performance was OK. Um, but we had a purist concern around this user land proxy and the volume of RTP, given the scale that RTP engine would otherwise permit. So we've now come up with um, what's essentially a hybrid voice compute node. So it's using Debian as the, as the base OS rather than Rancher OS, which we used previously. Um, RTP engine is installed directly on the host OS, but then we install all of the networky stuff um, as containers on Docker on, on top of that. So we've got the benefit of BGP announcing loopback addresses and that type of thing, but we've also got the benefit of RTP engine being able to use the kernel module and you know, really fly as, as if it's purely on the bare metal. And that seems to be working really, really well. They've done some awesome, awesome work there. Um, there's a question at the back there, Cathy. So since you were having to rewrite the Docker networking engine, I presume that was before the Docker networking plugin uh, existed. Uh, but regardless, uh, did you consider or uh, evaluate Project Calico since it does essentially the same kind of um, BGP related? Uh... We, we looked at a lot, yeah. Now, bear in mind, we, we started this four years ago, three years ago, good, good, good while ago. Yeah. Um, it it was definitely around four years ago. Yeah, and, and things, have, things have moved on a lot. And originally, we didn't use Docker. We used, um, we used Triton, which was um, Joyance, or SDC, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. as they call right. it now. The Solaris. Um, and that did, a, that did a lot of what we needed out of the box. You know, a container could be a first-class citizen and all, all that type of, type of good stuff. But frankly, none of us understood Solaris. And we had fundamental issues with just, just managing um, the thing. And whilst it supported... Um, the Docker syntax, if you like, it did so through an interpreter. So it wasn't fully compatible with how you do things on your laptop. And we had right. two, two modes of operation. So we went to, we went to pure Docker, and it was, a, frankly, a bit of an overnight grumpy decision on, on my part. You know, screw it. We're getting rid of that. We're having, we're, we're having Docker. But, but, but yeah, you're right. The, a lot of the decisions that we made were at a, a point in time, and we've moved, you know, moved on from that. If you're starting today, there's, there's probably other, other options. So, the solution of, um, well, like I say, the solution of, of, of the new uh, network plugin was um, one we moved on from anyway. The, the, the way we work now would probably be defensible with things as they are today, um, but, but there may well be better ways of doing it if you start, start from scratch. Yeah, so in that sense, have you looked at lower level uh, container runtimes other than Docker? Uh, so for instance, Rocket or uh, the, now the container D is kind of separate, but uh, Various other options now exist, including SystemD's native uh, one. Yeah, that uh, you have a whole lot more control over uh, than you do through Docker. Yeah, we did back in the day, um, but we went with the grain. To be perfectly honest, we went the we went the easy way. But not Kubernetes, the easy way. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> my talk tomorrow. <laughs> Are you going to tell people how to install it? Uh, I, I'm not going to go into installing it, no. There we are. Um, <laughs> I'm happy to do agree, a awesome four-hour workshop in installing <laughs> Kubernetes on bare metal, yes, and happily. <laughs> but not tomorrow. Any more for any more. No, thank you very much. <laughs>